Good evening, everybody. This is BJ Herner. Thanks for joining us. We're gonna wait a few minutes while the participants join us. So we will start with Peter Hertzman in a few moments. Stay tuned. All right, we've got the thumbs up to get started. Thanks everybody for joining us. Hello and welcome to one of today's Tiger Alumni Week webinars, How to Cook Anything. I am BJ Herner, Interim Executive Director of Corporate and Foundation Relations at RIT and your moderator this evening. Before I introduce our speaker, there are a few housekeeping points I want to go over. All attendees have joined in mute mode. However, your questions can be entered in the Q&A box at any time throughout the discussion. We will make every effort to address all of your comments and questions throughout the webinar. This webinar will be recorded and made available in the upcoming weeks. A communication with how to access the recordings will be sent out and also posted on our website. If you have any technical questions, please feel free to type those into the chat box as well and we will do our best to get you the appropriate answers. We would like to thank our premier sponsor, Sharp Notions, as well as our Tiger sponsor, Rochester Regional Health, for helping make this week's programming possible. We also would like to thank our Access Services teams for helping us make this webinar accessible for all of our alumni. Real-time captioning is available within the webinar and our interpreters will be spotlighted during the presentation. The pandemic has had a major impact on everyone, including our students. We thank all of our alumni and friends for the support you have given to our students during these uncertain times. If you are interested in supporting or continuing your support, make sure to mark your calendars for this year's Roar Day, which will be held tomorrow. We will have giving challenges, an alumni scavenger hunt, and more. So please consider making a gift to support students who need it now more than ever. Can't wait for War Day? You can make a gift right now by visiting rit.edu backslash R-O-A-R and your gift will be counted towards the Roar Day total and help RIT achieve its $1.5 million goal. Now, on to our session. We are pleased to welcome Peter Hertzman as he talks about how to cook anything. Peter's career included work on the space shuttle, developing new medical devices and procedures, and professional and recreational culinary education. Today, he is known primarily as a culinary historian with a primary concentration on technology and policy. He has presented eight times at the Oxford Symposium on Food and Cookery, three times at the Dublin Gastronomy Symposium and numerous other international meetings. He is the author of three books and numerous journal articles and was an invited speaker at the Culinary Institute of America, the Exploratorium, the Museum of American Heritage, and the Research Chefs Association. He has been on numerous radio and television programs, including the Martha Stewart Show. Peter's most recent book, 50 Ways to Cook a Carrot, is not about cooking carrots. It's about cooking methods. The carrot is simply an inexpensive, readily available food. If you are familiar with and truly understand cooking methods and ingredients, you can truly cook anything. Before we jump into our conversation and your questions, let's first watch this fascinating 30 minute video overview together. Please enjoy. That means you're listening to XCRF via Cunha Coahuila in the Republic of Mexico, your cleared channel station that covers every state in the nation. Early one morning in late September 1967, I packed my 1966 Chevy 2 and headed out Interstate 80. My destination was Rochester, New York. Early on the fourth morning of my journey, just past Cleveland, I turned left and joined Interstate 90. Southwest of Rochester, I switched to I-490 and headed into town. After circling twice on the incomplete inner loop, I located Nathaniel Rochester Hall, the men's dormitory. 
I found street parking in the same block. School was still a week away from opening, but I wanted to drop off my footlocker before heading to Montreal for five days at Expo 67. A bit more than a week later, I walked over to the Clark Building and located the classroom on the second floor where my first photo science class would be held three times a week. If the room had been updated since the building was built, it was not apparent. The classroom could have been used as a set for a 1930s movie. The large black chalkboard at the front of the room was long beyond its useful life. I found a seat and waited for Judy Garland to start singing. At the appointed time, Professor Hollis N. Todd walked in. He banged his papers onto the desk in the front of the class in the manner typical of teachers wanting the attention of their students. Without saying a word, he wrote across the chalkboard, variability exists in all processes. For emphasis, he underlined the five words twice. This statement came to define my RIT experience and also every aspect of my life ever since. Traditionally, the teaching of cooking has been related to who was doing the cooking. Cooks were mostly one of two groups, cooks who cooked for people who were not related to them and those who cooked for themselves or the family. Cooking was class related. If you could afford to have someone cook for you, you hired a cook. If you could not afford to hire a cook, you learned to get by. Both groups of cooks learned their craft from someone with more experience. As early as the late 14th century, books were written to instruct the lady of the house, manor, or estate on how to direct her help in the finer points of cooking and household management. In more rarefied households, the lord and lady maintained little or no knowledge of what happened below. They depended on senior help to instruct their juniors. But that was in Europe. In the American colonies, those unable to hire kitchen help relied upon the kindness of others, such as older relatives, to teach them how to cook. As the population of the American colonies grew, so did the divide between the developing classes. Depending on the location and wealth of the family, the required lessons could be minimal or extensive. Colonists in rural areas had more opportunity for variety in their diet. They had agriculture and they had the rewards of hunting and foraging. Rudimentary meals could be prepared with minimal instruction. A roast partridge could be dressed and cooked in a method similar to a roast quail or roast turkey. Poultry is poultry. Likewise, the meal savory pudding could be prepared from a variety of ingredients using the same method every time. Pudding is pudding. Underprivileged town-dwelling colonists were likely to eat a simple porridge for their single meal each day. At times, maybe a simple soup of onions, similar to that of European peasants, would provide a bit of change. These diners, who may have eaten from a common pot or bowl standing up due to a lack of furniture, were more concerned with consuming sufficient calories than dining on haute cuisine. In addition to face-to-face -face teaching, cooking knowledge in colonial times was passed from generation to generation. Many of the early American manuscript cookbooks that exist today started elsewhere and traveled across the ocean with the author or a descendant. Once in America, recipes and other notes were added to the document by subsequent generations. Some colonists brought printed cookbooks from their motherlands or purchased imported ones in their new country. The first cookbook published in the American colonies was The Complete Housewife by Eliza Smith. The year was 1747. This volume was actually the fifth edition. The original was published in England 20 years earlier. Foreign cookbooks lacked dishes made with ingredients that were uniquely American, unless those ingredients were already commonly available in Europe, such as the turkey. The first cookbook written by an American and published in the United States was American Cookery by Amelia Simmons. This slim 48 page volume was first issued in 1796 and among other firsts is the first book to suggest serving cranberry sauce with turkey. The book begins with a 13 page chapter titled Directions for Catering and for Procuring the Best Viands, Meat, Etc. Many of the ingredients described were at the time unique to Northeastern America. American cookery was reprinted many times through the first few decades of the 19th century. The success of America's first homegrown cookbook did not open floodgates to competing volumes, but it did trigger a steady drip. American cookery was joined by other significant cookery books and some of lesser significance. Arguably the most significant cookery book of the pre-Civil War period was Miss Beecher's Domestic Receipt Book, published in 1846. Catherine Beecher wrote this cookery book to supplement her 1843 work, a treatise on domestic economy for the use of young ladies at home and at school. 
Both books were part of the lengthy list of feminine literature she produced during her long life. Although the receipt book contains much about cookery, much of the book is devoted to related subjects, such as procurement, cooking for the sick, hiring and counseling domestic servants, setting the table, and kitchen furniture. The furniture section proposes providing storage in the kitchen that wouldn't become common for at least half a century. The early work on domestic economy has a large section devoted to house design. Both books address how the woman of the house instructs the kitchen help. The recipes are intended for the housewife to instruct the cook, who most likely possessed few, if any, reading skills. Beecher advocated education for women. Her Hartford Female Seminary was just one of a number of educational institutions designed for women. Much of the subject matter of these women's colleges was similar to men's only colleges, but significant scholarship also was devoted to household subjects and domestic concerns, which were considered the realm of women in her day. Such seminaries served to cultivate and spread sexual stereotypes and gender roles. The vast majority of women and some men were destined to enter a kitchen by obtaining their cooking education in traditional ways. In the post-Civil War period, many of the changes in the American fabric were reflected in the culinary world, especially in how information passed from cook to cook. The pace of the population moving from rural to urban life quickened. With this change came a change in meal times for a part of America. Factory workers couldn't go home for a large noontime dinner. By the end of the 19th century, the concept of lunch was created, and prior to the First World War, lunchrooms were established for the new female secretarial help, so they didn't have to come in contact with factory workers. With these dining changes came a subtle shift in how cooking was taught and learned. Women in the workforce had less chance to pass cooking information from mother to daughter. The 19th century saw cooking move from the hearth with wood to iron stoves powered by coal and other solid fuels. Wooden brass and iron cooking tools were replaced by cheaper steel tools. Improvement in infrastructure meant that food products could travel farther from their sources. Emerging agricultural clubs and societies helped farm productivity improve. Increased food processing meant less food needed to be made from scratch in the home kitchen. In the post-Civil War period, church groups raised money by publishing community cookbooks. Cookbooks created by immigrants often were written in their native language and shared recipes that often were familiar to readers. Unlike cookbooks from the experts, these books reflected the cooking of particular groups. The structure of these community cookbooks assumed that the reader already knew how to cook. Many scholars consider Catherine Beecher to be the creator of the home economics movement. Home economics truly came into play when the Morrill Act of 1862 created the land-grant college system. The objective set forth in the act included higher educational programs and vocational arts, specifically mechanical arts, agriculture, and home economics, much of it for rural America. Congress funded agricultural experiment stations, which were administrated by the land-grant colleges. In 1914, the Smith-Lever Act started federal funding for cooperative extensions, which are also tied to the colleges. Extensions reached every county in the nation and are responsible for a significant amount of training, including cooking, of the nation's rural residents. Training for prior generations was provided by one's elder. Now the instruction would be a bit more formal. For the city dweller, culinary education evolved differently. In 1872, Maria Parloa's the Apple Door Cookbook, containing practical receipts for plain and rich cooking, was published. In 1876, she was invited to give a lecture on cooking and digestion in New London, Connecticut. This led to further successful lectures in Boston the following spring. In October, she opened Miss Parloa's School of Cooking. After five years, she closed her popular but not financially sustainable Boston School and opened one in New York City. In addition to her normal classes, she provided free evening lessons to immigrant girls. After another five years, she closed the New York school and retired, much wealthier, to Boston, where she devoted herself to studying cooking and household management in Northern Europe, traveling, writing, endorsing products, and occasionally teaching. The Appledore cookbook had been simply a collection of recipes. Her later books gave greater attention to household management, kitchen design, and procurement. In 1879, the Women's Educational Association expended $100 to establish the Boston Cooking School. Their objective was 
to offer instruction in cooking to those who wish to earn a livelihood as cooks or who make practical use of such instruction in their families. Although typical lessons included 10 or 12 recipes, the recipes were taught as examples of cooking methods. The school's clear goal was to teach cooking, not recipes. As Mary Lincoln, the school's first principal and one of the pioneers of the domestic science movement, wrote years after her retirement, many of my pupils were ignorant of the common foods, of the management of a fire, and the simplest principles of cookery. In 1902, the Boston Cooking School became part of Simmons College. A number of other cooking schools were established about the same time and most shared similar goals. This was the period where scientific cooking was becoming established, so curricula included anatomy, nutrition, digestion, sanitation, household management, and exercise. Some of the schools were private, others were attached to social welfare organizations. In 1894, while still at the Boston Cooking School, Mary Lincoln published Mrs. Lincoln's Boston Cookbook, What to Do and What Not to Do in Cooking. The book replaced individual handouts that the school had previously used. Besides providing the students with the background material and recipes required for the various classes, the book also was a guide for others wanting to teach cooking and all that it entailed at the time. The book, like the classes, used recipes as a way of teaching cooking methods. In 1896, Fanny Farmer, a later principal of the Boston Cooking School, published the Boston Cooking School Cookbook. Farmer's book borrowed liberally from Lincoln's book, and until it was surpassed by the joy of cooking in 1944, it was the best-selling cookbook in the United States. In the early 1880s, the reformist socialist settlement movement started developing in cities. By the 1920s, the country had almost 500 settlement houses, some of which remain active to this day. Settlement houses function on a philosophy of scientific philanthropy, a belief that instead of giving direct relief, charity should give resources to the poor so they could break out of the circle of poverty. The movement focused on providing educational and recreational facilities for European immigrant women and children. Part of the education was to teach immigrant women how to cook American food with locally available ingredients. One outcome of the movement was the Settlement Cookbook. First published in 1901, the book's cooking lessons were from classes presented by the Settlement House of Milwaukee, Wisconsin. The book, at least initially, was representative of Midwestern Jewish immigrant life and evolved as the clientele of the Settlement House changed through the years. It was also one of my mother's first English language cookbooks when she arrived alone at the age of 20 from Germany in 1934. Near the end of the 19th century, lessons in cooking began to appear in popular culture, not just in cookbooks and in cooking schools. In 1885, Good Housekeeping magazine began publication. Two other women's magazines preceded it, McCall's and Ladies Home Journal. The prototype for all these magazines was Gotti's Ladies Book, which was published from 1830 to 1878. These women's magazines combined fiction with general interest articles. Pages were filled with fashion and other items considered of importance only to women. Good Housekeeping differed from the other magazines of the period with its multi-page cooking section. The section was not large enough, however, to give one the impression that Good Housekeeping was a cooking magazine. More in tune with the concept of a cookery magazine was the Boston Cooking School magazine of culinary science and domestic economics, which was published from 1898 to 1914 when the name was changed to American Cookery. In this form, the magazine lasted until the start of the Second World War. Under either masthead, the magazine provided its readers a bit of fiction, like other women's magazines, but it was much more related to meal production and general housekeeping. For many immigrant women, especially those who arrived as teenagers, magazines provided a source of knowledge not available elsewhere. In 1835, the New York Herald offered the first section in a newspaper directed specially towards women, but it wasn't until the turn of the 20th century that saw a women's section in most local papers. The sections focused on what journalism schools of the time described as the four Fs, family, food, furnishings, and fashion. Newspapers typically hired women to write these sections. Recipes often were presented with a theme, such as how to throw a midsummer luncheon or soiree. Recipes were presented with little added information about technique or method. It was generally understood that this information was already well instilled in the reader. In the 1970s, 
Daily newspapers across the nation, partially in response to second wave feminism and partially reacting to the reality that women were not the only cooks in many households, created separate food sections, leaving the remains of the women's section as the society page. Recipes were presented around a theme, season, or holiday. As the decades passed and the readership did less cooking and advertising revenues declined, food sections emphasized restaurant views and reviews, equipment reviews, and gastropolitical news. Recipes remained an important but much diminished part of the food section. As newspapers shrunk in size since the millennium and faced financial troubles, the food sections were eliminated. Some newspapers have retained the food section only on their online versions. As rural America slipped deeper into depression in the 1920s, the Bureau of Home Economics of the USDA created Aunt Sammy, a fictional housekeeper that gave household and cooking advice along with other commentary over the radio. Its focus was to help rural women prepare nutritious meals based on simple recipes. Aunt Sammy was voiced by a different woman at each radio station using a standardized script. The homemaker could listen to the program without interrupting her chores. The program ran five days a week from 1926 to 1944. In addition to Housekeeper's Half Hour, Aunt Sammy's official program title, numerous local radio programs promoted culinary education in one form or another. Many were sponsored by food producers, such as flour mills, and included entertainment along with the instructional information. The second half of the 20th century brought many changes. Post-war prosperity changed the American lifestyle, including how we lived and ate. Television ownership expanded greatly from 1950 to 1970, and with it, dining moved from the kitchen or dining room to the living room. Nightly meals, as portrayed on Father Knows Best, became a memory or a goal, depending on one's circumstances. More families spent dinner time in front of their television sets passively watching instead of engaging the gathered family members. All three daily meals required less cooking from scratch than in the past. Whether the entire meal was comprised of a frozen TV dinner, was made from elements purchased already made, either fresh or packaged, or was made from scratch, less time was being spent in the kitchen. Even if teaching opportunities existed for family members to take advantage of, children were increasingly busy outside of the home after school during the dinner preparation hours. On the professional side, the Culinary Institute of America, in its original form, began in 1946. Most modern professional culinary schools started in the 1970s. Even though professional training was formalized at this time, most restaurant cooks still learned the majority of their knowledge as part of their work experience. The first cooking show on American television was broadcast in 1940 and other programs followed. Most lasted less than a season or two. Success required a personal host and a national audience. That person was Julia Child, and the year was 1963. The French chef ran for 10 seasons, presenting a total of 201 episodes. Over the years, Child had a number of other series, but none were as memorable as the French chef. The Frugal Gourmet ran for 261 episodes from 1973 to 1997, until the show's host, Jeff Smith, ran afoul of the repressed memory movement. After a four-year television career in Alberta, Canada, Martin Yan presented over 2,000 Yan Can Cook episodes since 1982 on American TV, and he is still going strong. Jacques Pepin also started on American TV in 1982 and continued creating new series until a few years ago. During the period, ending with the millennium, many other TV chefs have come and gone. All of these television programs follow a similar form present a number of recipes, usually three, in the standard half-hour program format. Depending on the subject, a method or technique may be thrown in. Through the years, Pepin has probably been the most prolific in sneaking technique lessons into his program. Most televised cooking programs also generated the cookbook to parallel the program. Since the majority of the pre-Food Network programs are broadcast on public television, Cookbook sales and other secondary promotions, such as public appearances, provided income for the program hosts. For the most part, these books simply added headnotes to the recipes. 
A novice cook attempting to prepare a recipe would probably have serious problems, especially if they didn't have some previous experience with the cuisine. Starting in 1993, the Food Network eventually grew from being a PBS clone to a game show network. Recently, the network's combination of reality TV competition combined with instructional programs has lost some of its peak glow. Much of its content is now available online, including short video classes. Many of these classes seem almost like parody rather than instruction. Other cable channels offer some form of food programming, providing competition at some level. PBS, the original food television network, has a large library of previously presented programs available for internet television subscribers, plus modern programming. Much of the modern programming is much more aspirational than instructional. Currently, looking at where food comes from or how it gets to the table is dominating traditional three recipe programming. Related to food television are food related podcasts, related only because they are recorded. The podcast industry approaches the whole subject of food from a broader standpoint than television does. Pick an aspect of food, history, ingredients, methods, processes, politics, regulations, and a food podcast addresses it. I find the podcasts I follow to be much more informative than what's available in popular writing, but still, podcasts are not the best source of instruction. Prior to the 1970s, most cookware was purchased in hardware stores. Williams-Sonoma, currently the largest cookware store in the United States, traces its origins to 1953, the year Chuck Williams purchased a hardware store in Sonoma, California, and slowly began converting the inventory from hardware to European cookware. Sir Latab opened its first store in 1972, and Lecture's Housewares opened its first standalone store in 1977, and closed all 490 stores in 2001. In the 1990s, most cookware stores started to rebrand themselves as lifestyle stores, and much of their stock resembles that. For the most part, cookware stores have come and gone. Online retailing have all but wiped them out. Many cookware stores created cooking schools to help sell products and create brand awareness. Initially, the stores were generally interested in teaching, but as ownership changed, the in-store schools were eliminated, shrank substantially, or were used to promote products with teaching being secondary. In my 10 years experience of teaching for one national chain, most students were interested only in learning to prepare certain recipes. They were not really interested in learning how to cook. Whereas our ancestors learned to cook poultry of various sizes with various methods, modern students wanted to specifically learn how to make cocoa van. Most have no interest in general poultry cooking principles. As the world breezed past Y2K, home cooking became more lifestyle oriented. The perceived nutritional value, along with the color of the pot used, became more important than flavor and enjoyment. High-end restaurant cooking became more political, local, organic, natural, and healthy. Tweezers, abstract pleating, and a large number of identifiable ingredients became essentials. The Detroit effect was in full bloom in both restaurants and the home. Since the 1950s, cookbooks have remained a popular source of cookery information. Today, the printed cookbook business is thriving. Besides the previously mentioned TV cookbooks, which continue today, other genres within the area of cookery have evolved. Memoir cookbooks were popular for a while. Coffee table books still sell well. Single topic books deal with subsections of the world, be they countries or neighborhoods, a particular appliance, a particular portion of a meal, or even a specific ingredient. For the most part, all of these books simply present recipes. The reader is expected to already have an understanding of the methods necessary to complete the recipes. The occasional book of techniques, Jacques Pepin's New Complete Techniques being a notable example, represents a small number of the cookery books to enter the market in the last 70 years. Few cookbooks deal with cooking methods. Even professional books tend to stress recipes over general instruction. Modern technology is not improving our access to teachers who can help us learn to cook. At the start of 2020, there was approximately 500 million blogs with 2 million new postings every day. We don't know how many of these blogs are food related. Let's just agree that there's lots of them. Most are just recipe repeating machines, but a few spend some of their effort to teach how and why. 
Enter a recipe title into Google and more recipes will be returned than any one person can cook or even read in a lifetime. Coco Van produces over 20 million results. Checking the first five recipes listed, none provide any information as to why things are done the way they are done and none address the fact that the coke in the original recipe was meant figuratively rather than literally. So here we are in 2020. Professional cooking schools are folding and the best way to learn restaurant cooking is to work in a series of restaurants. Rare and fortunate individuals learn to cook from a relative. Most of today's good cooks are good at preparing a number of recipes, but when challenged to come up with something new or at least different with a specific ingredient, they stumble. Why? To be clear here, producing dishes from recipes, whether written or verbal, is different from knowing how to cook. Our ancestors were less concerned with specific recipes than knowing how to cook in general. They had to work with the ingredients they had, not the ingredients they wished they had. They had to cook with the equipment they had, not the equipment they wished they had. But to answer the question of why, students in professional schools start by learning stocks and sauces. From day one, they are completing recipes that they will use to complete other recipes. In 2015, I presented a lecture at the Culinary Institute of America on the scientific basis for all sauces and how if you understood the science, you could actually prepare any sauce, no recipe required. I received rave reviews from the instructors in attendance, but was panned by the students, at least those that managed to stay awake. My host explained that one of the basic problems the school had to contend with was that students enrolled to become the next network star, not cooks. They were interested only in the hows of cooking, not the whys. Many home cooks' interest in cooking often starts when they first achieve independence from their parents or other overseers, like school administrators. They find a recipe for a dish they like and try to cook it. They soon realize that they are lost. So they consult friends, they consult books, they consult the internet. All give guidance on that recipe, but not how to cook. Many aspiring home cooks think that if they learn a few recipes, they know how to cook. Unfortunately, it's not that simple. I teach a simple exercise of choosing a common ingredient and then quickly thinking of how many ways you can prepare it. Usually I do the exercise in a class situation where there can be a didactic exchange of possible dishes. One afternoon, I decided to do the exercise in seclusion. I chose carrots as my star ingredient because they are readily available and inexpensive especially if you buy 10 pound bags of juicing carrots. I came up with 104 different ways to cook carrots that afternoon. I whittled the number down to 50, found a generous publisher and convinced to write a book to illustrate the concept. I even wound up having to illustrate the book. As an illustration of the principle, the book is okay, but how do you learn how to cook? Cooking requires the knowledge of methods, techniques, and ingredients. Methods differ subtly from techniques. How to braise is a method. Holding a whisk in a specific way is a technique. The single ingredient exercise is used to identify different methods of cooking. The variety chosen is often based on the cook's knowledge of that ingredient. How much water does it contain? What happens to it as heat is applied or removed? What is its composition? Does it react with other ingredients? This may seem to be merely an odd collection of factoids but when put together in logical sequences, these bits of information tell us how to cook. Trying to learn how to cook by learning fragments of information would be difficult, so we piece the fragments together in such a way that an item or a dish is prepared. The recipe that specifies our actions admits all the supplementary information that we automatically incorporate as experienced cooks. So in the end, recipes make incomplete teachers of methods, techniques, and ingredients. But to learn how to cook, we need to learn these very same methods, techniques, and ingredients. We seldom need to learn recipes. Going back to where I started, cooking is not about dealing with exactitude. Cooking is understanding the variability that exists in the underlying processes and learning how to embrace it. Even though he said it 50 years ago, Professor Todd was correct. That was wonderful. Thank you, Peter, for putting that compilation together and that history it was fascinating. 
I invite all of our participants, if you have a question, to enter it into the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. And while I wait for those questions to come in, um, here's a fun fact about Peter. Peter is one of our rare alumni who has attended both the Rochester City Campus and the Henrietta Campus. Peter, do you have any particular reflections on that point of history? That's a special attribute. Well, they're you know very much different, but you have to remember that uh, when I went to uh, Henrietta in 1968, the school wasn't even completed yet. Uh, the main thing I remember is they decided in you know, like men's dorm, everybody had to live in the dorm because the loan they had from the New York Dormitory Authority or something like that. And they said, if you moved out, they threatened us with expulsion. So I tested that about six months later oh. because of the quarter mile walk from uh, the cafeteria to the uh, dormitory, which in those days was just open field in the middle of the winter. So we do have one question that's come in from a participant named Julie. She comments that the video mentioned the Detroit effect. What did you mean by that? Okay. Uh, think about uh, most dishes, you know, like Boston baked beans or San Francisco sourdough, uh, Kansas City ribs, any of that sort of stuff. You can put any city name in front of a dish and it all of a sudden sounds fancier and more exotic, except for Detroit. <laughs> oh dear, poor Detroit. Um, so I have another to Detroit, the, the Detroit pizzas are fantastic though. They have a different style from other people. That's amazing. But no one goes and says it's a Detroit style pizza. <laughs> right. So, all right, you've, you've made some wonderful points about the fact that, that we're not just following recipes. We need to learn methods and techniques. But doesn't that take a lifetime? If you're somebody who is trying to raise a family and you're, you're working full time, how do you go about doing this? Well, it's certainly much tougher than it was when, you know, we learned from our, you know, other people in the kitchen. Uh, actually, I proposed to the CIA a, a change in the curriculum where they could teach all that in a matter of three semesters. But uh, so it, what it takes for the individual is a lot of ways going past just the recipe and beginning to think about it. Uh, you know, sometimes it's, you know, if you're going to do a, I don't know, a chicken fricassee, you go look for, you know, 30 recipes for chicken fricassees and see what, what's equivalent in them. What's where is the method similar? Where are things different? You know, the ingredients may be different, but most of them will have some sort of browning the chicken first and then adding uh, the garnish ingredients and browning those and then some liquid and braising it until it's done. And so you begin to learn uh, braising from doing that. And you go to places like my website where I talk about uh, a little video on heat uh and where i talk about like brazing because most brazing is not, is taught wrong there was actually a book that was brought out in about 2001 called brazing and there was you know 150 raising recipes in there and i'd say over half of them were not brazing but simmering so brazing is a process where you put uh, the meat or whatever you're cooking in either no liquid or a small amount of liquid put a lid on it, stick it under low heat, you can do it on top of a stove, you can do it in an oven, and come back in a few hours and there's all this liquid that has come out of the food and it's the steaming, the combination of steaming above the water level and simmering below the water level that does the cooking. So if you take something like pulled pork, for instance, which there's lots of different recipes and all these things is, you know, hand holding and magic this and this secret handshake and stuff, you can take, you know, you go down and buy uh, in different parts of the country, it has a different name, but it's pork shoulder, Boston butt is another name for it, which has to do with the, the shape of or a, a barrel. It has nothing to do with the uh, anatomy of the, of the pig. And uh, you take that and you stick it in a, a heavy casserole type dish like cast iron, or I've done it even in a clay, Chinese clay pot. And you put that 
in you know, essentially a crock pot temperature. In fact, you can put it in a crock pot, just plain. If you want, you can season it and stuff, but that's all extra. You just put that plain. That piece of pork starts off at two thirds water. And if you slowly heat it up, the collagen begins to shrink. It squeezes some of the water out and that becomes the juice that's in the bottom of that. You'll also release a little bit of fat. The process of what you're trying to do though, is you're trying to convert the collagen, which is a long chain protein into gelatin, which is a short chain protein. And that happens at a, instantly at about 180 degrees, but it'll also happen long-term at a lower temperature. So you can do this at a very low temperature, take six hours or something like that. You don't have to do anything with it. It's been braised and you come back and you have this beautiful pork you can now pull apart and add sauce to and do other things with. So that's a method. And, you know, there's not too many books that, that deal with methods. So that's what I tried to do in the carrot book. Obviously you can't braise carrots that way, but uh, there are other things certainly you can. Um, and it's searching out that it's going like the Jacques Pepin technique. A lot of what they call techniques are actually methods. And so you have to sort of divide it out. And, um, uh, you know, it takes a little bit of forethought, I guess you would say. You just can't open the book and have it all right there. So I don't know about everybody else, but now my mouth is watering. So thanks a lot, Peter. <laughs> now I'm starving for pork butt or pork shoulder. So, um, okay, another question that has come in from participant Christine is, what do you think of Michael Pollan's book, Cooked? As he dealt with the natural history of cooking, he focused on cooking methods. Are there particular resources, books, shows, podcasts you'd recommend for learning about methods and techniques? Is there a cooking school in the Rochester area? Lots of questions from Christine. Okay, so start off with, I don't know nothing about cooking schools in the Rochester area. Uh, take care of that. I have not read the book. I am not a Michael Pollan fan, uh, mainly because he approaches things as a journalist. And even like his Botany of Desire, which had a lot of history, it was uh, still very narrow in, in his approach. Um, one of the things you get into in, and this is a thing I have with other culinary historians, where they tend to dive very deeply and not very wide. Okay. One of the things I was trying like in the videos show that, you know, you have like the United States, you have a movement of population from a rural to an urban society in the last half of the 19th century. And that greatly affects all sorts of stuff. It's not just the cooking and, you know, it affects a lot of things. You have infrastructure changes. All those are related. You have the development of steel in 1855, uh, cheap steel, I should say. And that affects a lot of things. So you have to look at it in, from a whole range. And my experience with him, uh, he's uh, head of journalism, journalism school at UC Berkeley here, and he tends to be uh, a journalist in, in his approach rather than a historian. And not to be taken out on journalists, because some are quite good, but he tends to go and talk to a whole bunch of people and whatever they say, he writes down as that's the fact without going uh, deeper into it. Uh, where to learn is tough. Podcasts, there are certainly podcasts that I listen to, but not necessarily, none of them are actually saying, you know, this is how you cook. Uh, I think it's important in, uh, as we cook to have some uh, feel for, uh, the politics of food, certainly, the injustices of food, um, the understanding when somebody, you know, says they want something organic or something, what that really means, because uh, that organic, most people don't understand, for instance, the organic label on their ingredients. If it doesn't say 100% organic, and, the, and it's the U.S. organic law, it only has to be 90%. There are cutouts which allow non-organic products to be labeled as organic. You get in, you know, there's a lot of marketing type things, you know, things like kosher salt, uh, sea salt. Those are all marketing terms that have no meaning, even though there's people who like to dream up meaning and stuff. Uh, let's see the third part of that. Uh, if she wants to send me a copy of the book, I'll be happy to read it. <laughs> <laughs> So, all right, moving on to the next question from Julie. Julie works at Mount Holyoke College. 
She says, you now have me being inquisitive and wanting to go to the archives to see what cooking classes they may have offered in their curriculum. You know, your, your photos were fascinating. How did you get your hands on all those photos? Uh, it's mostly through the internet, a lot of searching and, uh, you know, certainly the books, a lot of them, uh, I've been downloading books since the internet archive started. So uh, I have my own personal collection of, you know, 500 ancient and expensive cookbooks all in PDF form, meaning they have no value. Uh, but I've, uh, so like that, I actually went searching for cooking schools. I, Mike's, I would, don't know specifically about that, but the earliest one was actually at MIT. And at MIT, uh, it was taught, I believe, through the Department of Chemistry originally. But it was, they, they were home economics courses or uh, science, do it, you know, the scientific cooking. There's an excellent book by, um, shouldn't take the, find, the time to find it now, uh, Laura Shapiro called Perfection Salad, which is the whole history of the movement. And uh, it's why I know about things like Maria Parlo and stuff since she was early in that. But we have in this, this period, a, this desire for people to bring science into cooking and to make it, you know, like I said, with, starting with Catherine Beecher, that it's not just cooking, it's, it's the whole part of homemaking, if you will, if you allow that term. Uh, it, it's everything you needed to know. And that was traditional. I mean, you look at 17th century books and they give medicines and, you know, how to treat the farm animals and everything else in some of these cookbooks. Uh, but that's all get started in there. Things like the Boston Cooking School, when it was under uh, Mary Lincoln, they had a whole program for teaching the cooks of the middle class most middle class women did not cook. It was part of their social responsibility to hire immigrant women uh, or who were from a lower economic class, usually from the same immigrant basis they were from. So in my case, like my, my grandmother who was German, her cooks were always German. Uh, a lot of these girls, especially in Boston were Irish, they didn't read. And so the housewife, the, the middle class woman would bring the cook with them in order for them to learn how to cook the dishes they wanted them to learn. But it, when it required reading and taking notes, the, uh, uh, the sponsor would do that. Uh, when the school was taken over by uh, Fanny Farmer, she said, no, 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 I want to make money. And so she started charging uh, upper middle class women who had this sort of, you know, yeah, it'd be fun to have tea and make some of the food ourselves. And so they became the students. <laughs> Well, this is fascinating. I wish it could go on for longer because I have at least a dozen more questions of my own, not to mention the participants who are with us tonight. But unfortunately, the time has gone too fast and we need to uh, conclude this wonderful session with Peter. So thank you, Peter, for sharing your expertise with our alumni and our friends today. And thank you at home for joining us. As I mentioned earlier, we will send out information on how to access the recording in the near future. Also, don't forget to make your Roar Day gift by using the link that has uh, been posted in the chat box. Lastly, if you are not already connected to the RIT Alumni Association's social media cha channels, we encourage you to do so. And those links will also be found in the chat box. So once again, Peter, thank you so much. Thank you for joining us. And please, everyone, enjoy the rest of Tiger Alumni Week. Have a great evening, everybody. Bye, Peter. Stay safe in San Bye. Francisco.